Thank you, Alan. And let me add my welcome to those joining online and those uh, here in the building, especially if you're here for the first time or just visiting. It's great to have you with us. Uh, my name's Dan. I'm going to uh, uh, speak from that passage which Alan has just read to us now. And hope is a powerful thing. I don't know, any uh, Call the Midwife fans here? Anyone enjoy watching Call the Midwife? Oh, quite a few hands, maybe a few at home as well. Uh, we gave up on it a few years ago, as it happens. But uh, Jennifer Worth, the midwife who inspired the original series, writes this about treating people with cancer in the 1950s and 60s. She says, Hope is by no means confined to physical cure. Hope means something different to each one of us. Hope to see a daughter married or a grandchild born can keep life buoyant and content for weeks or even months beyond the realistic expectations of a medical prognosis. I find that amazing. She's saying that hope can be a better medicine than the best drug treatments. Hope is a powerful thing. And she concludes, she says, hope makes the future endurable. This is a passage about hope. Look at uh, how he begins. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope. Now, before you sort of dismiss this as a sort of bunch of spiritual platitudes or something like that, let me fill you in a little bit on the background. So Peter, uh, one of Jesus' closest friends, uh, he's writing this about 30 years after Jesus' death to a bunch of people who are scattered throughout what we call modern-day Turkey. And there's a chance that these people had been deported to Turkey from their homelands. Some of you know what it's like to live thousands of miles from home, not sure if you're ever going to be able to return home. But even if they hadn't been deported, uh, many of you will resonate with some of the experiences and challenges that they were facing as well. In his letter, uh, Peter writes of all sorts of challenges. He talks to them about facing false accusation, having unjust bosses. He talks of women in difficult marriage situations. He talks about physical persecution and verbal attacks because of their faith. They were ridiculed for not uh, living how everyone else around them was living. In other words, they, they were ridiculed for trying to live holy lives. They were also living with anxiety and fiery trials, he says, and spiritual attack from the devil. So these guys are really going through the mill. And some of those things I know will resonate deeply with some of you here and some of you listening. We might not face identical trials, but you know, maybe we face other trials, uh, physical health concerns or marriage difficulties, or you would deeply love to have a partner, or you're trying to get mental health support for your children, whatever it is. But Peter doesn't start off by addressing the very specific difficulties that these people are facing. He starts by reminding the believers of their living hope. And that's very deliberate, because as Jennifer Worth said, hope makes the future endurable. So however dark and difficult your life feels at the moment, if you are a believer in Jesus, he has given you a living hope. Focus on the hope, because the hope makes the future endurable. And this living hope puts our, our current struggles and suffering into, context, into perspective. So in verse 6, Peter says, uh, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, the, the things we've just been talking about. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, honor, and glory when Jesus Christ is revealed. So he's saying that their faith in Christ is the most precious thing they've got, even in the midst of severe trials. In fact, it's in the midst of those severe trials that their faith is most clearly seen, and their faith grows. I mean, we've seen that, haven't we? You know, when we were in the depths of the pandemic, how many of us were praying more, calling out to God more? Think of the people in Ukraine. The situation feels so helpless for them. Aren't they calling out to God more for help? And it's, it's in the context of our suffering that we, as we lean into God, that proves that our faith is genuine. I had a text message from a friend uh, a few weeks ago. His wife has got dementia, 
Uh, he had COVID, his wife had COVID, his wife had been taken into hospital with COVID. It was a pretty bleak time. And he said, needless to say, your prayers are appreciated. And then he just finished his text message by saying, Jesus lives. That is hope, isn't it? That is faith proved in suffering. That he was clinging on to hope in Jesus, even in the bleak situation. And you see, when we're in the middle of suffering, we need hope to cling on to. Hope makes the future endurable. That's why Peter reminds us of our living hope. And this, isn't, this, this living hope is not flimsy. It's rock solid, it's secure, and it lasts forever. It's not temporary, it's eternal. And so when we're going through great difficulties in life, think of this hope that we have. We need an even greater hope. That's exactly what we have in Christ. And so what's the basis for this hope? Well, Peter writes, uh, he's given, God has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Every time we gather on a Sunday, we're celebrating Jesus' resurrection. We are people of the resurrection. And if you've never looked at the evidence about what happened to Jesus after he died, I, I beg you to do so, because that is the basis of our faith. Read the eyewitness accounts. You know, uh, his body had been in the tomb, but when they went to the tomb on the third day, the grave clothes were still there, but the body had gone. The angel said, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here, he has risen. And hundreds of people saw him alive again. His closest friends were transformed from sort of fearful uh, cowards into bold ambassadors for, um, for Jesus and his resurrection. And so if you've never investigated that evidence for the resurrection yourself, uh, have a word with me afterwards. I'd love to give you a copy of a book I wrote a few years ago, which looks at all the, the evidence and some of the sort of counter-arguments and so on that people put uh, against the resurrection. But the bottom line is this. If Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, we would never have heard of him. This building wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be gathered in his name. He would just be a footnote in history. Look at the evidence. This is the grounds for the hope that we have, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into this living hope that he gives us, this rock-solid, real-life, never-ending hope. Desmond Tutu, the great Archbishop of Cape Town who gave so much of his life to fighting apartheid in South Africa, he had this great phrase. He was asked about the hope that he had Despite all the systemic racism, despite the violence, despite the corruption in politics and so on, and he said this, I am always hopeful. A Christian is a prisoner of hope. What could have looked more hopeless than Good Friday? But then at Easter, God says, from this moment on, no situation is untransfigurable. There is no situation from which God cannot extract good. Evil, death, oppression, injustice, these can never again have the last word, despite all appearances to the contrary. I love that phrase, prisoners of hope. You know, we're trapped by hope. We can't get away from hope. Even when things seem so bleak to us, hope is still there. Hope is alive within us. Even in the face of evil and death and injustice and oppression, we can't get away from hope. If you are a believer in Jesus, you are a prisoner of hope. And it's a hope that endures even in the face of death. There was a wonderful vicar called Mark, who I had the privilege of working with uh, once or twice. He was only in his 50s when he was given the diagnosis of terminal cancer. And as the consultant told him it was inoperable, Mark said this, I see this as a sentence of life, not of death. A beginning, not an end. Wow. Well, how about this from a Chinese house church leader known as Brother Yun. And this is a guy whose curriculum for aspiring pastors includes how to escape from prison. Because he knows that so many Chinese house church pastors land up in prison. And he wrote this, One day I may be killed for the sake of the gospel in a Muslim or Buddhist nation. If you hear this news, please don't grieve for me, 
but grieve for the millions of precious souls who are enslaved by Satan without any gospel witness. Death is not the end for a servant of God, but just the start of an indescribable, everlasting life in the presence of Jesus. Or as someone once put it, the church is the only organization that never loses a member through death. We have this living hope through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. We're prisoners of hope. Just this morning, I was praying about something, a situation, and I caught myself on thinking, this is hopeless. And then God gently reminded me, no, you're a prisoner of hope. No situation is beyond his power. It makes even the darkest future bearable. And, says Peter, we have an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for us. And, you know, some of the people that Peter was originally writing to may have had to lose their inheritance when they moved. Whether they were sort of forcibly deported or whether they moved voluntarily, sort of running for their lives, they may well have had to leave behind their inheritance. And again, some of you maybe know what it's like to have to give up on your inheritance, some of your future, to start life again in this country. So Peter reminds them and us that we still have this inheritance with our name on it. However much we've had to give up for the sake of Christ or for the sake of personal safety, we still have an inheritance which has our name on it, waiting in heaven for us. And this is a far better inheritance because this is one which is never going to decrease in value. You know, our eternal pension plan isn't going to suffer because of an economic depression. The glory that awaits us isn't going to get whistled down by the cost of living rises, uh, rising faster than interest rates. It doesn't work like that. And what is this inheritance? Well, it, it's not money. It's, you could think of it as lands. In the Old Testament, the Jews knew that their inheritance was the land of Israel. The land we'll inherit is the renewed creation. The Apostle Paul said, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. So more col colorful than the most sort of vivid spring colors, more breathtaking than the grandest mountains, more beautiful and glorious than the, you know, the most glorious sunsets. It will be beyond our wildest dreams. And it's kept in heaven for you as your inheritance. And of course, it's not just a land, but think of it as a home, our home with Jesus himself. It's going to be fantastic to see the Lord Jesus face to face, to meet with brothers and sisters from around the world, every nation and tribe and language, to be in a place where there's no more daily grind, no more arguments, no more sickness, no more worries about money. Instead, to be in a place so full of love and peace that our hearts just burst with joy at being in that home. Jesus said, my father's house has many rooms. I'm going there to prepare a place for you, and I'll come back to take you to be with me. Our eternal home. Last year, I read a book called Imagine Heaven. Uh, not the sort of book I normally read. It's written by a pastor who has read hundreds of accounts of near-death experiences. People who die for a few minutes, either in a, you know, a car crash or on the operating table or something like that, but then they're later on resuscitated. But many of these people describe having some sort of out-of-body experience where they almost sort of look down on themselves and then they float off into another world for a few minutes. And maybe, maybe it gives us a glimpse of what heaven is like. Many of the stories bear striking similarities. And what this pastor has done is he's compared all these accounts with the teaching in the Bible. And he's tried to show how some of these accounts uh, mirror the teaching in the Bible. Now, I'm not sure I agree with what he writes 100%, but I found it an enormously encouraging read. One man said of his brief visit to the next life, I've never ever felt more alive than I did then. I was home. I was where I belonged. I wanted to be there more than I had ever wanted to be anywhere on earth. Another said this, 
Part of the joy I was experiencing was not only the presence of everything wonderful, but the absence of everything terrible. There was no strife, no competition, no sarcasm, no betrayal, no deception, no lies, no murders, no unfaithfulness, no disloyalty, nothing contrary to the light and life and love. The absence of sin was something you could feel. There was no shame because there was nothing to be ashamed of. There was no sadness because there was nothing to be sad about. There was no need to hide because there was nothing to hide from. It was all out into the open. Or one lady who had endured terrible abuse from a young age wrote this. Well, she said it was challenging to find the right words to describe all she'd experienced because human language just doesn't even come close. She said words like beautiful and brilliant and amazing fall, fall far short. What I experienced in heaven was so real and so lucid and so utterly intense, it made my experiences on earth seem hazy and out of focus, as if heaven is the reality and life as we know it is just a dream. She describes being immersed in a feeling of complete and utter purity, perfection, unbrokenness and peace, a kind of assurance she's never experienced on earth. It was like being bathed in love, she said. Now, make of those stories what you will. But it seems to me as though they correlate to much of what Scripture teaches about how wonderful the life to come is. Our eternal home with God, a place of perfect love, and that's our inheritance. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's got your name written on it. It is waiting in heaven for you. And so often our thinking is backward, isn't it? We, we think that earth is the real thing and heaven is the sort of ethereal, less than real shadow. But the Bible would say it's the other way around. That heaven is the real thing and this is just the pale imitation of what we're waiting for. So this living hope and this wonderful inheritance help to keep us going through devastatingly difficult times. But there's one final encouragement I want you to notice here. Because maybe some of you are thinking, well, I'm not sure how much more I can cope with. Life is so difficult. I'm facing so many difficulties, I don't know if I can keep this up. Well, listen, it's not just that your inheritance is kept in heaven by God for you, but that God keeps you for heaven. Look at it in verse 4 and 5. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. That word shielded there, think, think of a Roman shield. It's something strong protecting you. You are shielded by God's power. Nothing... He's not going to let anything sort of fatally get you. Nothing is going to be too much for you to cope with. There'll be no last straw that breaks the camel's back for you. God himself is shielding you, protecting you, keeping you until Jesus comes again. And the verb here is an ongoing verb. God's power is going on shielding you day after day after day after day. It will never stop. You don't have to hold on in your own strength. God is shielding you and keeping you. Earlier on, Lena mentioned some of the struggles and, and sort of mistakes that Peter made in his last, in Jesus' last few days uh, before he was killed. So remember how Jesus had said to Peter on Monday, Thursday, that Peter was going to deny Jesus. And we know what happened. Peter did land up denying Jesus three times, but Jesus lovingly uh, forgave him and, and told him to pass to other believers. But do you remember what else Jesus said to Peter on Monday, Thursday? He said, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Peter failed spectacularly, didn't he? He wept bitterly. He would have been crushed by what he had done. He would have thought, how can I ever keep going? How can I look Jesus in the eye again? But Jesus had prayed that Peter's faith wouldn't fail. You know, he could have landed up like Judas so easily. But Jesus had prayed his faith wouldn't fail. Jesus' power had kept him. 
even when things seemed so bleak. Peter had been guarded and preserved and protected. And if you're thinking, I'm not sure how much more of this I can take, or if you're thinking, I'm not sure I can ever look Jesus in the eye again because of what I have done, this picture of Peter is for you. Jesus protected and guarded Peter. He shielded him by God's power, and that is what God is doing for you. He will keep you until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. There's so much encouragement here in this passage, isn't there? Whatever the trials you're facing, remember that in his great mercy, God has given us, we don't have to earn it, he's given it to us, a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. It's kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power. And no wonder Peter carries on, in all this you greatly rejoice, though for now you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Joy, that inexpressible and glorious joy, he calls it in verse 8. Some of you heard Jules's testimony uh, back in March more than a year ago, diagnosed with breast cancer with two very young children. She endured surgery and months of chemo and radiotherapy, all in the midst of COVID. And yet she described joy. She said, I learned that this joy is not something that depends on how I feel or what is happening around us in different circumstances, but I have felt God's joy, which is his presence with us. That is the joy that comes from a living hope. Brothers and sisters, let's enter into the fullness of this living hope together. I'm going to invite the band to uh, come back up and uh, let's all stand and just be quiet for a minute before we worship. Let's be quiet and then I'll pray for us and we'll worship God for this living hope. And maybe just in the quietness, think if there is a particular situation in your life or that you are worried about in our world which seems utterly hopeless to you. And pray that God would bring his living hope into that situation for you. Lord Jesus, however difficult the circumstances that we face, would you make us prisoners of hope? Thank you that the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead shows us that no situation is outside your power and control. Would you come and breathe hope and joy into us? Would you come by your power and keep us, shield us when we are struggling? And would we be bearers of hope and joy to those around us? Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who's given us in his mercy new birth into this living hope. We praise you, Jesus. Amen.